Okay, so we're with uh, Yuki Kabe, who is uh, Rascom's um, life cycle analysis specialist here at the conference. Yuki, um, how, first of all, how much uh, BioP um, are you producing at the moment? Yes, so, uh, we produce annually 200,000 tons of bio-based poly polyethylene. And, and where's that mostly being used? Well, it's um, actually in a multitude of applications, but mostly packages. Yeah. Yes, packages and some uh, durable products, but mostly in, in packages, both rigid and flexible. Okay. Now, yesterday you, you talked about um, shopping bags that were a little bit over 50 micron uh, thickness. Yes. Um, and um, I wanted to know, actually, how recyclable are these bags? Well, um, every green PE bag is fully recyclable and uh, actually it can be mixed with the, the existing uh, collection flows so it doesn't have to be segregated from uh, standard polyethylene since they are chemically identical. Uh, so they are 100% recyclable although they are not recycled yet because lack of, of collection, but uh, they could be 100% recycled. Uh, and, it, and it literally is the lack of a suitable recovery system uh, that's, that's stopping it? Uh, yes, uh, actually there is not, not only collection, uh, but also um, quality of the recycled product, or the, let's say the recycled resin. Uh, but this is not a problem with uh, biomaterials, but with all polymers in, in themselves, because uh, although we, we, we think about uh, polyethylene as being all polyethylene or polypropylene or, and uh, the current uh, separation flows only distinguish between these macro resins, uh, inside the polyethylene, you have polyethylene for multiple applications. So injection polyethylene is different from extrusion, blow molding polyethylene, and so on. And uh, when you collect polyethylene and mix them all, to, they all together, they have different processing characteristics. Mm -hmm. So maintaining those characteristics through time is, in my point of view, uh, the main challenge to an effective recycling uh, of plastics in general and biopolymers included. So we've got we've got a packaging item um, that could be recycled, isn't being recycled uh, because of a lack of a of, a, of an infrastructure to, to handle it. Is that actually holding back uh, adoption by brand owners? Um, I think what. Um, the main obstacle might be misinformation. Uh, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, uh, there is a misconception of what is green, what is sustainable. Mm. And, um, and so uh, we have to, to overcome these uh, preconceived ideas about what sustainability is uh, to get into the core of sustainability, which can only be assessed through uh, tools like life cycle assessment, which give you an overall picture of, uh, of the problem. Uh, since we are talking about packages, it's not related to, to bags, but um, it was also mentioned here that food waste is a major source of sure. environmental impact. Yeah, sure. uh, and so when we talk about packages, we only think about the end of life impact of the packages, but we forget about the benefits that packages uh, perform or give uh, in their use phase. So let's imagine um, a very controversial package, which would be, would be a multi-layer uh, package, flexible package for beef. Okay. Okay, with barrier, modified atmosphere, and so on. Um, we've conducted a study. I don't have the numbers um, uh, exactly, but I will give you uh, an overall, an overview of the study, that the total cost, that means not only the cost of the package, but the cost of the environmental impact of the package, uh, would be around 150 times less 
than the value the package has protected during its lifetime. Right. Yes. For instance, to to uh, grow one to have one kilogram of beef, you would have a av world average of around 14 kilograms of CO2 emitted during the life cycle of the beef, as well as hundreds of cubic meters uh, of water being consumed. So when the package protects the meat, it doesn't protect only that meat. It protects all the resources used to produce the meat. So uh, we would get to a true cost uh, for beef of around possibly nine US dollars per kilogram more than it costs today if we consider all the environmental impacts. Sure. So that is the total value that the package is protecting. So, and, and that would be uh, around uh, 150 times more than the environmental impacts the packages cause. So we recognize that plastic products uh, due to their very strengths might be a problem in the end of life. Now, plastics are lightweight, so they get blown away, they float. They are very stable in the environment, so they will stay there for 400, 500 years. Uh, but those are the very uh, characteristics that make plastic such a good material. Uh, it's a very good answer and very thorough, and thank you. I think, uh, sometimes I think the problem is uh, people choose to believe what they want to believe. That's true. And I think, irrespective of whether it's bio-based or fossil fuel, plastic always has that problem. And I'm thinking of a, a, a more commodity bag than the one we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the single-use retail bag, right. which we all know, actually, is environmentally more sound than the paper one, and yet... Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, we have multiple life cycle mm. assessment studies, including some made in the UK, the most thorough probably made by uh, UK DEFRA, yeah. Uh, that shows that uh, carrier bags in high-density polyethylene are the most sustainable alternative. As a life cycle uh, an analysis specialist, um, you have facts on your side, but do you think that statistically-based factual argument is the one that will win over mm. brand owner and consumer opinion? No, no, unfortunately not. Mm. Um, I think the old saying that uh, an image is worth a thousand words uh, applies very well here. You know? So one image of a turtle tortured in a six-pack beer ring is worth all the arguments that I can give for uh, the use of those plastic products. Yeah, it's uh, so, but I think it's about time we stop making decisions based on emotions, uh, based on preconceived ideas. We have to, uh, to mature. We have to make decisions based on science, based on facts and arguments. Um, and at some point, we have to get to, uh, to the opinion formers. And I believe the media has uh, a very strong influence in that. We have to get the message, the right message, out to the public so that they can distinguish about what is uh, emotional and what is fact, what is science-based. I think that's very fair comment. Are you, um, uh, it's just it's just green PE, isn't it, that, that Brascombe? Right now it is. Because yesterday we heard somebody come through with a green PE, I think. Um, uh, well, that would be news for me. I uh, think it was Nesta. Nesta? Green PP, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, well, we, we do have some projects. Actually, we developed uh, a, a, a process to produce uh, bio PP uh, some years ago. Um, at that time, with oil prices as high as $130 per barrel, mm -hmm. it was uh, feasible, yeah. but not at current prices. What is it, about 40 now or something? Well, yeah, yeah, less than $50 okay. per barrel, so it, it wouldn't work uh, on this uh, scale. Uh, but we are currently developing other alternatives uh, to produce uh, not only polypropylene, but also other intermediate chemicals. Right, so that, that is, is a possibility. Just the last question, it was something you said yesterday. Um, I, 
I think I heard it right. Uh, th- th- there's no competition, uh, Brask and Brazil, between food and, and feedstock. Yes, uh, that's right. For, for, for our feedstock, uh, there is no competition. Uh, and actually, talking about uh, competition between uh, food and feedstock in Brazil is a little bit out of context. Uh, Brazil has the largest uh, agricultural frontier, let's say. Uh, we have more than 100 million hectares of land available. That would be roughly three times the size of Germany of land still not explored commercially. And that would be excluding biomes like Amazon, rainforest, the Pantanal, wetland basins. Uh, Brazil also has one of the most strict environmental codes in the world. It, requi- it requires every property to reserve between 20 and 30 percent of the total area uh, for protected lands or there are what we call permanent protection areas like uh, mountaintops and riversides and and so on. Um, So even considering all those protected lands, we still have a lot of land available. And also what we, we, we use is less than 0.2% of all the land available in Brazil. So plenty of scope for expansion uh, yes. physically as well as different uh, grades of plastic. Yes, ju- ju- it's, it's just a figure, but um, if we would replace or if we would use all the land available in Brazil to plant sugarcane, mm-hmm. uh, we could supply the world with replace all the standard uh, 40 million tons a year, I think, uh, consumption of polyethylene with biopolyethylene. So there is a lot of land available. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very good. That was very interesting, too. Thank you.